Let's go back to yesterday. If you haven't seen the verdict in the Scott Nelson case, this is the jury saying what they recommend should be the punishment for the man who killed Jennifer Fulford. Watch. Okay, so he's sentenced to multiple life sentences. Terry, I think there was one holdout, one juror held out, and you need that unanimous decision. What do you think happened here? That's interesting because there clearly were aggravated circumstances. So it was a heinous crime, et cetera, et cetera. They could have sentenced him to death. And if there's a holdout, then to your point, you don't have a unanimous jury there. But I think there's a little bit of reverse psychology going on here. Since the defendant himself asked to be put to death, maybe the jury thought that this would be worse for him. I have to ask you, Professor, uh, this is the same thing. Terry and I talked about this for a long time. He gets on the stand. He made such an argument about what prison was like for him. This is what I want you to know. If you send me back to prison, my life is going to be awful. I'm, uh, you know, I may be killed. I've been, everything been brutalized in prison. Is that what the jury thought and said, well, you did something awful. This, we think, is even a worse punishment for you. Listen, in 1916, Justice Cardozo stated the law is not lax in its forfeiture of life. This man got on the stand several times, and he clearly, from watching his testimony, we all in some way, shape, or form agreed that there was something emotionally disturbing going on with him. And I think that at least that one juror may have been reluctant to do so. I think everything taken in combination, this person was somewhat reluctant to put him to death, to exact the ultimate penalty against him. Now look, 16 hours of deliberation here, uh, this is what the end result is, doesn't necessarily mean that there were other jurors who felt a certain way going in and they changed their mind. I mean, 16 hours on a penalty phase, is that normal? Well, I think that they were, as Kurt said, seriously considering putting this man to death, and you don't take that lightly. So because of his psychotic behavior, I think they're thinking, well, maybe we should just sentence him to life. It's my understanding, Professor, that they plan to appeal this, and they've raised some grounds for a new trial, saying everything that the knife shouldn't have been permitted into evidence, his confession shouldn't have been put into evidence. Likelihood that he'll get this thrown out and get a new trial? I don't really think, I don't see it. You know, we've been, I've been observing the trial with you all this time, and, uh, you know, these motions, some of these motions have been brought before, so there really has to be some form of reversible error. Judge would have had to have made an error in the trial court. I just haven't seen it. I want to ask a, one question from both of you. Terry, I'll start with you. Do you think him taking the stand helped him or hurt him? I think it may have helped him because he absolutely looked as though he had some mental illness going on. So that might have saved his life. Now, Professor, I'm going to ask you the same thing because I made the point during the trial phase that, you know, he takes the stand, made a compelling argument on his, what he thought was a compelling argument that he never intended to kill Jennifer Fulford. He was put on the street. He was starving. He went to somebody, wanted to steal money, broke in, and then she died as a result. But he never specifically wanted to kill her. Uh, that was never, there was no premeditated, desi premeditated design. Now, ultimately, the jury found him guilty of first degree murder, but it seemed that they were kind of holding out on that yeah. intent aspect. Did him taking the stand, both in this trial or the penalty phase, help him or hurt him? I think it helped him in the penalty phase. And, you know, I sat here and I stated that he wasn't helping himself and so forth. However, I have to go back on that. I, I think that it helped him in the penalty phase. As far as the trial is concerned, I don't think it helped him at all. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, this is something we're never going to forget, him taking the stand. Uh, I've seen a lot of defendants take the stand. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like Scott Nelson taking the stand. Well, we're going to have more opportunity to talk about him later on. We're going to take a break because when we come back, we want to focus more on the Rosenbaum and Rosenbaum trial. We'll be right back.